Elias Galenus or Claudius Galenus, Greek, Kappa Lambda Alpha Delta Iota Omicron Gamma Alpha Lambda Eta Nu, September 129 AD C 200 C 216, often anglicized as Galen and better known as Galen of Pergamon, slash Eln slash, was a prominent Greek physician, surgeon, and philosopher in the Roman Empire. Arguably the most accomplished of all medical researchers of antiquity, Galen influenced the development of various scientific disciplines, including anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, and neurology, as well as philosophy and logic. The son of Elias Nikon, a wealthy architect with scholarly interests, Galen received a comprehensive education that prepared him for a successful career as a physician and philosopher. Born in Pergamon, present-day Bergama, Turkey, Galen traveled extensively, exposing himself to a wide variety of medical theories and discoveries before settling in Rome, where he served prominent members of Roman society and eventually was given the position of personal physician to several emperors. Galen's understanding of anatomy and medicine was principally influenced by the then current theory of humorism, also known as the four humors black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm, as advanced by ancient Greek physicians such as Hippocrates. His theories dominated and influenced Western medical science for more than 1,300 years. His anatomical reports, based mainly on dissection of monkeys, especially the Barbary macaque, and pigs, remained uncontested until 1543, when printed descriptions and illustrations of human dissections were published in the seminal work De Humani Corporis Fabrica by Andreas Vesalius where Galen's physiological theory was accommodated to these new observations. Galen's theory of the physiology of the circulatory system endured until 1221, when Ibn al-Nafi published his Encyclopedia of Medicine entitled As Shamil Fi Tib, in which he established that blood circulates, with the heart acting as a pump. Galen saw himself as both a physician and a philosopher, as he wrote in his treatise entitled that the best physician is also a philosopher. Galen was very interested in the debate between the rationalist and empiricist medical sects, and his use of direct observation, dissection, and vivisection represents a complex middle ground between the extremes of those two viewpoints. Many of his works have been preserved and slash or translated from the original Greek, although many were destroyed and some credited to him are believed to be spurious. Although there is some debate over the date of his death, he was no younger than seventy when he died. In medieval Europe, Galen's writings on anatomy became the mainstay of the medieval physician's university curriculum, but by that time they suffered greatly from stasis and intellectual stagnation. Some of Galen's ideas were incorrect, he did not dissect a human body, nor did the medieval lecturers. Galen's original Greek texts gained renewed prominence during the early modern period. In the 1530s, Belgian anatomist and physician Andreas Vesalius took on a project to translate many of Galen's Greek texts into Latin. Vesalius's most famous work, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, was greatly influenced by Galenic writing and form. Early Life, AD 129-161 Galen's name Gamma Alpha Lambda Eta Nu, Galnos comes from the adjective Gamma Alpha Lambda Eta Nu, Com. Galen describes his early life and on the affections of the mind. He was born in September AD 129, his father, Elias Nikon, was a wealthy patrician, an architect, and builder, with eclectic interests including philosophy, mathematics, logic, astronomy, agriculture, and literature. Galen describes his father as a highly amiable, just, good and benevolent man. At that time Pergamon, modern-day Bergama, Turkey, was a major cultural and intellectual center, noted for its library, second only to that in Alexandria, and attracted both Stoic and Platonic philosophers, to whom Galen was exposed at age 14. His studies also took in each of the principal philosophical systems of the time, including Aristotelian and Epicurean. 
his father had planned a traditional career for Galen in philosophy or politics and took care to expose him to literary and philosophical influences. However, Galen states that in around AD 145 his father had a dream in which the god Asclepius, Aesculapius, appeared and commanded Nikon to send his son to study medicine. Again, no expense was spared, and following his earlier liberal education, at 16 he began studies at the prestigious local sanctuary or Asclepium dedicated to Asclepius, god of medicine, as a theta epsilon rho alpha pi epsilon upsilon tau, Theraputs, or attendant, for four years. There he came under the influence of men like Eshrian of Pergamon, Stratonicus, and Satyrus. Asclepia functioned as spas or sanitoria to which the sick would come to seek the ministrations of the priesthood. Romans frequented the temple at Pergamon in search of medical relief from illness and disease. It was also the haunt of notable people such as Claudius Carax the historian, Elias Aristides the orator, Polemo the sophist, and Cuspius Rufinus the consul. In 148, when he was 19, his father died, leaving him independently wealthy. He then followed the advice he found in Hippocrates' teaching and traveled and studied widely including such destinations as Smyrna, now Izmir, Corinth, Crete, Cilicia, now Kukurova, Cyprus, and finally the great medical school of Alexandria, exposing himself to the various schools of thought and medicine. In 157, aged 28, he returned to Pergamon as physician to the gladiators of the high priest of Asia, one of the most influential and wealthy men in Asia. Galen claims that the high priest chose him over other physicians after he eviscerated an ape and challenged other physicians to repair the damage. When they refused, Galen performed the surgery himself and in so doing won the favor of the high priest of Asia. Over his four years there, he learned the importance of diet, fitness, hygiene, and preventive measures, as well as living anatomy, and the treatment of fractures and severe trauma referring to their wounds as windows into the body. Only five deaths among the gladiators occurred while he held the post, compared to sixty in his predecessor's time, a result that is in general ascribed to the attention he paid to their wounds. At the same time he pursued studies in theoretical medicine and philosophy. Later years, AD 162-217 Galen went to Rome in 162 and made his mark as a practicing physician. His impatience brought him into conflict with other doctors and he felt menaced by them. His demonstrations there antagonized the less skilled and more conservative physicians in the city. When Galen's animosity with the Roman medical practitioners became serious, he feared he might be exiled or poisoned, so he left the city. Rome had engaged in foreign wars in 161, Marcus Aurelius and his colleague Lucius Verus were in the north fighting the Marcomanni. During the autumn of 169 when Roman troops were returning to Aquileia, a great plague broke out, and the emperor summoned Galen back to Rome. He was ordered to accompany Marcus and Verus to Germany as the court physician. The following spring Marcus was persuaded to release Galen after receiving a report that Asclepius was against the project. He was left behind to act as physician to the imperial heir Commodus. It was here in court that Galen wrote extensively on medical subjects. Ironically, Lucius Verus died in 169, and Marcus Aurelius himself died in 180, both victims of the plague. Galen was the physician to Commodus for much of the emperor's life and treated his common illnesses. According to Dio Cassius 72.14.34, in about 189, under Commodus' reign, a pestilence occurred which at its height killed 2,000 people a day in Rome. This was most likely the same plague that struck Rome during Marcus Aurelius' reign. Galen became physician to Septimius Severus during his reign in Rome. Galen compliments Severus and Caracalla on keeping a supply of drugs for their friends and mentions three cases in which they had been of use in 198. 
The Antonine Plague The Antonine Plague was named after Marcus Aurelius' family name of Antoninus. It was also known as the Plague of Galen and held an important place in medicinal history because of its association with Galen. He had first-hand knowledge of the disease and was present in Rome when it first struck in 166 AD, and was also present in the winter of 168-69 during an outbreak among troops stationed at Aquileia. He had experience with the epidemic, referring to it as very long-lasting, and described its symptoms and his treatment of it. Unfortunately, his references to the plague are scattered and brief. Galen was not trying to present a description of the disease so that it could be recognized in future generations, he was more interested in the treatment and physical effects of the disease. For example, in his writings about a young man afflicted with the plague, he concentrated on the treatment of internal and external ulcerations. According to Niebuhr, this pestilence must have raged with incredible fury, it carried off innumerable victims. The ancient world never recovered from the blow inflicted upon it by the plague that visited it in the reign of M. Aurelius. The mortality rate of the plague was 7-10%, the outbreak in 165-168 would have caused approximately 3.5 to 5 million deaths. Otto Seek believes that over half the population of the empire perished. J. F. Gilliam believes that the Antonine Plague probably caused more deaths than any other epidemic during the empire before the mid-3rd century. It is believed that the Antonine Plague was smallpox, because though his description is incomplete, Galen gave enough information to enable a firm identification of the disease. Galen notes that the exanthema covered the victim's entire body and was usually black. The exanthem became rough and scabby where there was no ulceration. He states that those that were going to survive developed a black exanthem. According to Galen, it was black because of a remnant of blood putrefied in a fever blister that was pustular. His writings state that raised blisters were present in the Antonine Plague, usually in the form of a blistery rash. Galen states that the skin rash was close to the one Fusidides described. Galen describes symptoms of the alimentary tract via a patient's diarrhea and stools. If the stool was very black, the patient died. He says that the amount of black stools varied. It depended on the severity of the intestinal lesions. He observes that in cases where the stool was not black, the black exanthema appeared. Galen describes the symptoms of fever, vomiting, fetid breath, catarrh cough, and ulceration of the larynx and trachea. Eudemus When the peripatetic philosopher Eudemus became ill with quartan fever, Galen felt obliged to treat him since he was my teacher and I happened to live nearby. Galen wrote, I return to the case of Eudemus. He was thoroughly attacked by the three attacks of quartan ague, and the doctors had given him up, as it was now midwinter. Some Roman physicians criticized Galen for his use of the prognosis in his treatment of Eudemus. This practice conflicted with the then current standard of care, which relied upon divination and mysticism. Galen retaliated against his detractors by defending his own methods. Garcia Ballester quotes Galen as saying, In order to diagnose, one must observe and reason. This was the basis of his criticism of the doctors who preceded Aelagus and Askeptos. However, Eudemus warned Galen that engaging in conflict with these physicians could lead to his assassination. Eudemus said this, and more to the same effect, he added that if they were not able to harm me by unscrupulous conduct they would proceed to attempts at poisoning. Among other things he told me that, some ten years before, a young man had come to the city and had given, like me practical demonstrations of the resources of our art, this young man was put to death by poison, together with two servants who accompanied him. Garcia Ballester says the following of Galen's use of prognosis, in modern medicine, we are used to distinguishing between the diagnostic judgment, the scientific knowledge of what a patient has, and the prognostic judgment, the conjecture about what will happen to him. Galen, 
like the Hippocratics, was not. For him, to understand a clinical case technically, to diagnose, was, among other things, to know with greater or lesser certainty the outcome for the patient, to prognosticate. Prognosis, then, is one of the essential problems and most important objectives of Galenic diagnosis. Galen was concerned to distinguish it from divination or prophecy, both to improve diagnosis technically and to enhance the physician's reputation. Death The 11th century pseudo lexicon states that Galen died at the age of 70, which would place his death in about the year 199. However, there is a reference in Galen's treatise on Theory Act to Piso, which may, however, be spurious, to events of 204. There are also statements in Arabic sources that he died in Sicily at age 87, after 17 years studying medicine and 70 practicing it, which would mean he died about 217. According to these sources, the tomb of Galenus in Palermo was still well preserved in 10th century. Nutton believes that on theory act to Piso is genuine, that the Arabic sources are correct, and that the Suda has erroneously interpreted the 70 years of Galen's career in the Arabic tradition as referring to his whole lifespan. Budin Milo more or less concurs and favors a date of 216. Contributions to Medicine Galen contributed a substantial amount to the Hippocratic understanding of pathology. Under Hippocrates' bodily humors theory, differences in human moods come as a consequence of imbalances in one of the four bodily fluids, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. Galen promoted this theory and the typology of human temperaments. In Galen's view, an imbalance of each humor corresponded with a particular human temperament, blood sanguine, black bile melancholic, yellow bile choleric, and phlegm phlegmatic. Thus, individuals with sanguine temperaments are extroverted and social, choleric people have energy, passion, and charisma, melancholics are creative, kind, and considerate, and phlegmatic temperaments are characterized by dependability, kindness, and affection. Galen's principal interest was in human anatomy, but Roman law had prohibited the dissection of human cadavers since about 150 BC. Because of this restriction, Galen performed anatomical dissections on living, vivisection, and dead animals, mostly focusing on pigs and primates. This work was useful because Galen believed that the anatomical structures of these animals closely mirrored those of humans. Galen clarified the anatomy of the trachea and was the first to demonstrate that the larynx generates the voice. In one experiment, Galen used bellows to inflate the lungs of a dead animal. Galen's work on the anatomy remained largely unsurpassed and unchallenged up until the 16th century in Europe. In the middle of the 16th century, the anatomist Andreas Vesalius challenged the anatomical knowledge of Galen by conducting dissections on human cadavers. These investigations allowed Vesalius to refute aspects of Galen's anatomy. Among Galen's major contributions to medicine was his work on the circulatory system. He was the first to recognize that there are distinct differences between venous, dark, and arterial, bright, blood. Although his anatomical experiments on animal models led him to a more complete understanding of the circulatory system, nervous system, respiratory system, and other structures, his work contained scientific errors. Galen believed the circulatory system to consist of two separate one-way systems of distribution, rather than a single unified system of circulation. He believed venous blood to be generated in the liver, from where it was distributed and consumed by all organs of the body. He posited that arterial blood originated in the heart, from where it was distributed and consumed by all organs of the body. The blood was then regenerated in either the liver or the heart, completing the cycle. Galen also believed in the existence of a group of blood vessels he called the Reti Mirabile in the carotid sinus. Both of these theories of the circulation of blood were later shown to be incorrect by Ibn al-Nafi. In his work De Motu Musculorum, 
Galen explained the difference between motor and sensory nerves, discussed the concept of muscle tone, and explained the difference between agonists and antagonists. Galen was a skilled surgeon, operating on human patients. Many of his procedures and techniques would not be used again for centuries, such as the procedures he performed on brains and eyes. To correct cataracts in patients, Galen performed an operation similar to a modern one. Using a needle-shaped instrument, Galen attempted to remove the cataract-affected lens of the eye. His surgical experiments included ligating the arteries of living animals. Although many 20th century historians have claimed that Galen believed the lens to be in the exact center of the eye, Galen actually understood that the crystalline lens is located in the anterior aspect of the human eye. At first reluctantly but then with increasing vigor, Galen promoted Hippocratic teaching, including vena section and bloodletting, then unknown in Rome. This was sharply criticized by the Erasistratians, who predicted dire outcomes believing that it was not blood but pneuma that flowed in the veins. Galen, however, staunchly defended vena section in his three books on the subject and in his demonstrations and public disputations. Contributions to Philosophy Although the main focus of his work was on medicine, anatomy, and physiology, Galen also wrote about logic and philosophy. His writings were influenced by earlier Greek and Roman thinkers, including Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics. Galen was concerned to combine philosophical thought with medical practice, as in his brief work that the best physician is also a philosopher. He took aspects from each group and combined them with his original thought. He regarded medicine as an interdisciplinary field that was best practiced by utilizing theory, observation, and experimentation in conjunction. Several schools of thought existed within the medical field during Galen's lifetime, the main two being the empiricists and rationalists, also called dogmatists or philosophers, with the Methodists being a smaller group. The empiricists emphasized the importance of physical practice and experimentation, or active learning in the medical discipline. In direct opposition to the empiricists were the rationalists, who valued the study of established teachings in order to create new theories in the name of medical advancements. The Methodists formed somewhat of a middle ground, as they were not as experimental as the empiricists, nor as theoretical as the rationalists. The Methodists mainly utilized pure observation, showing greater interest in studying the natural course of ailments than making efforts to find remedies. Galen's education had exposed him to the five major schools of thought, Platonists, Peripatetics, Stoics, Epicureans, Pyronists, with teachers from the Rationalist sect and from the Empiricist sect. Opposition to the Stoics Galen was well known for his advancements in the medical field and the circulatory system, he was also involved with philosophy. He developed his own tripartite soul model following the examples of Plato, some scholars reference him as a Platonist. Galen would not have agreed with this claim because he was primarily a scientist and all of his claims could be supported by scientific evidence, Plato was purely a philosopher. He also developed his own personality theory which was connected to liquids in the body, and believed that there was a physiological basis for mental disorders. Lastly, he connected many of his theories to the pneuma, which is where he most strongly opposed the Stoics' definition and use of the pneuma. The Stoics, according to Galen, failed to give a credible answer for the localization of functions of the psyche, or the mind. Through his use of medicine, he was convinced that he came up with a better answer, the brain. The Stoics only recognized the soul as having one part, which was the rational soul and they claimed it would be found in the heart. Galen, following Plato's idea, came up with two more parts to the soul. Galen also rejected Stoic propositional logic and instead embraced a hypothetical syllogistic which was strongly influenced by the peripatetics and based on elements of Aristotelian logic. Localization of Function one of Galen's major works, On the Doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato, 
sought to demonstrate the unity of the two subjects and their views. Using their theories, combined with Aristotle's, Galen developed a tripartite soul consisting of similar aspects. He used the same terms as Plato, referring to the three parts as rational, spiritual, and appetitive. Each corresponded to a localized area of the body. The rational soul was in the brain, the spiritual soul was in the heart, and the appetitive soul was in the liver. Galen was the first scientist and philosopher to assign specific parts of the soul to locations in the body because of his extensive background in medicine. This idea is now referred to as localization of function. Galen's assignments were revolutionary for the time period, which set the precedent for future localization theories. Galen believed each part of this tripartite soul controlled specific functions within the body and that the soul, as a whole, contributed to the health of the body, strengthening the natural functioning capacity of the organ or organs in question. The rational soul controlled higher level cognitive functioning in an organism, for example, making choices or perceiving the world and sending those signals to the brain. He also listed imagination, memory, recollection, knowledge, thought, consideration, voluntary motion and sensation as being
please subscribe and thanks for watching.